Give him some praise in his place. Glory to your name. Right. So, today is Pentecost. I'm excited that you are all here in your gold and yellow and orange. I know I look like a banana up here. It's all good, though. A banana. Okay. This is what we're talking about, but let's show them that Paleo Hebrew. All right. What does it say on the screen? It's weeks. How do I say weeks in Hebrew? Shaba. Now, the last two characters are always joined together. So it's Shaba Y. How do they pronounce it in modern day Hebrew? Shavuot. There ain't no T on this word. Anybody ever heard of Shavuot? There's no V in Hebrew either. That's weird. It's, there's only a B. It's Shabawai. Okay, now show them uh, how we pronounce it. Shabawai, that means weeks. T technically, it means sevens. Okay, let's see the meanings of these individual characters so we can figure out what the Most High is showing us when he says this. This first character is a Shah. It means to destroy, consume. It's a picture of teeth. It also means to eat. You guys see that? This next one is a house. It means house. It also means in. It means family or dwelling. That's what ba. Jim, that means in the name. So it means in. Okay. What's this next one? It's a wa. It always means and, but it can also mean to add to. It's a picture of a nail. The last one is an eye. It means to see or to know. It's a picture of an eye. It means to experience. So when we see this word, Shabawai, what is it telling us? What's the red say? Now that's amazing because what do we do? What do we do on the Feast of Weeks? We come together to eat. Show them, show them the translation. This ancient Hebrew was amazing because eat with the family and secure your experience. Your experience is in the kingdom. He commanded you three times every year to come and meet so you can eat with the family. Isn't that amazing? That ancient Hebrew is absolutely amazing to me. I got a question for you guys. Um, so now we know what Shabawai is, but what is Pentecost? What language is that? That's Greek. What does pent mean? Five. That means five. Fifty. And it has been exactly 50 days since first fruits. All right. Give me Acts chapter two, verse one. We got a lot to cover, so we're going to dig in deep. Acts chapter two, verse one says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Why does it say fully come? Because it was the day, not the night. Pentecost has to be on a Sunday. Does that make sense? But when did Sunday start? Saturday night when the sun went down. So this tells you that it's daytime. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they, who's the they? The disciples were all with one accord in one place. Every Christian, even the Pentecostals, they know about Pentecost. But they don't know that Pentecost is an Old Testament celebration called the Feast of Weeks. See, if I start my, my journey with Christ on this side of the Bible over here, I'm missing half of the story. I'm missing more than half of the story. I'm just reading all of this over here. And then I'm like, yeah, it's called Pentecost. Okay, but why were these men there? We're going to get into that. Give me Leviticus chapter 23. And let's take a look at verse 1. The scripture says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, verse 2, Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts of Yahweh, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Whose feast is it? Okay, it's the father's feast. Now jump down to verse 15. We had to point that out because some people will say to you, oh, you went to Shavuot? You went to Shavuot? What are you, Jewish? <laughs> no, this is not a Jewish feast. This is the father's feast. And if you call upon the name of the father, you need to be keeping his feasts. Now watch. Verse 15 says, and he shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. What day is the Sabbath on? Saturday. So when do I start my count? On Sunday, you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering. 
Okay, so at the time of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right after that, we bring a wave offering. It's a sheaf of our barley or whatever, and we wave that before the Most High. It says, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Where's my mathematicians at? How long is seven Sabbaths? That's 49 days. Okay, give me the next verse real quick. It says, even unto the morrow, after the seventh Sabbath, shall ye number 50 days and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. Guess what today is? Today is that 50th day and you are the new offering that you were offering to Yahweh. Jump down to verse 21 for me. It says, and ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day, that's today, that it may be an holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute for how long? forever in all your dwellings does he care where you go he don't care where you live you still got to keep this high holy day it shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations see pentecost is very important because it teaches us about the timeline of the most high go ahead and show him a graphic real quick let me show you guys see if you don't keep these feasts then you don't know what time it is so here we have a picture of a menorah and the menorah lines up perfectly with the seven holy days outlined in the book of Leviticus. This first one is the Passover. What happened on the Passover? Somebody tell me. Just make it real quick. What you got? Was that Aaron? Is that Aaron? Go. Okay, that's right. That's right. Good, good job, Aaron. The Passover was the day that we were put under the blood of the lamb. Isn't that why he passed over us? We were put under the blood of the lamb. Who's the lamb? So that was already telling you, you need to get under the blood of the lamb. And then what's the next one? It says unleavened bread. Well, Christ is the unleavened bread that came down from heaven. Okay. And then what happened? They killed him. <laughs> they killed him. We killed him actually. Yeah. The Israelites killed him. Okay. But did he stay dead? Nah, he don't die. He multiply. So look, he came up out the grave on first fruits. And that made him the first fruit to rise from the dead and never die again. So we celebrate first fruits. But see, now we're right in the middle. And this is Pentecost. Pentecost. What happened on Pentecost? You guys know the story. We're going to get into it. That's right. The rock Hakodesh came down and the disciples received the Holy Ghost. That's at the midway point. Now, I want you to view Pentecost as being judgment. Because we already covered those first three feasts. We're at Pentecost now. That means we got three more left to go. And all three of those feasts deal with judgment. Because when them trumpets start to blow, what happens after the trumpets blow? Right? Yahweh Shai comes back. And after he comes back, he gathers the children of Israel and the strangers that are so joining among them. And then we go somewhere into the wilderness to dwell with Yahweh Shai for a thousand years. What happens at the end of the thousand years? Satan gets released out of the bottomless pit and it's a whole nother war. Who wins? We already won that war. What you afraid of? We already won the war. Look, and then what happens? And then we dwell with the father forever and ever. Amen. Okay. So watch this. Now there are a couple other feasts which will not fit on the menorah because these are ordained by the most high, but we also have Purim and that's in the Bible. What does that represent? The first and second resurrection. That's right. Okay. And then we also have the destruction of Nicanor. Yep. What is that? Chopping up. Chopping up arms. <laughs> what does that represent? It's more than just chopping up. It, the destruction of the Antichrist. Okay. And then we have the feast of dedication. What does that represent? Rededicating our temple for the father's holy use. All right. So we already did these first three and now we are in the following feasts. Now watch this. Let's take a look. Because on the 50th day, Christ was on the earth. He died. He resurrected three days later. He walked around for 40 days and 40 nights. People saw him. He went back to heaven and 10 days later, he sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit landed on the apostles. The apostles spoke with languages. I know you may have been told that they spoke what? I don't even know what that is. They spoke, look, the scripture is going to show you that they spoke with 18 different languages. And it's also going to tell you why they spoke with those languages, because it has to be used for edifying. And then what? They received the Holy Spirit. They prophesied and 3000 souls were added to the church on that same day. Does that make sense? 
Now, you're going to learn that these 3,000 souls that were added to the church were Israelites. A lot of people think 3,000 Gentiles were added to the church on Pentecost. That's not what happened. Because were the Gentiles commanded to appear before the Most High three times in a year? No, they were not. So these people that were at the, ba the Feast of Weeks, when they heard the disciples speaking, what were those people? The scripture says they were Jews. And what did they hear? The testimony of Christ in the language that they could understand. And they were added to the church. Let's get into it. Give me Acts chapter 1, verse 1. We got a lot to cover. Let's go. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Yahawashai began to do and teach. Give me the next verse. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. Okay, so Yahawashai was taken up. And right here we're recounting the story of what took place. He gave commandments to the apostles. Let's take a look at the commandments. Give me verse 3. It says, To whom also he shewed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs. What does infallible mean? Undisputed. Undisputed. It is not a question whether 40 days. He was around for 40 days walking and eating and doing stuff. Infallible proofs. Being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of Yahweh. Give me the next verse. And being assembled together with them. Who's the them? The apostles. Christ was assembled together with the apostles. Commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem. But wait for the promise of the father. What's the promise? The Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, now watch this. He said, don't leave. You wait here because I'm, I'm sending something for you. It says, which saith he, ye have heard of me. Give me the next verse. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Does it say the Holy Ghost and fire? Yeah, but they teach you that you're going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Let me just break that down real quick. You're only going to get baptized with one. What does baptize mean? It means to be completely submerged. Where did it usually take place in? In a lake. Okay, so either you're going to get baptized with the Holy Ghost, which is you're going to be completely submerged in the Spirit, or you're going to get baptized in fire. In the lake of fire. You got one choice. What's it going to be? Either you're going to go with Christ, or you're going to keep going your own way. Okay, now watch this. He says, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Meaning, after this. Give me the next verse. When they were therefore come together, he asked of them, saying, Lord... I'm sorry. They asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What did they want to know? Are we, are we going back to the kingdom? But watch, you got to see this. They're already in the kingdom. Where's this taking place at? They're in Jerusalem and they're saying, will you at this time restore the kingdom to us? But they're already in the kingdom. But who is ruling the kingdom at that time? Rome is ruling the kingdom. So they said, man, is it about to jump off? Jesus, we need to know if we need to get our weapons ready. Now give me verse 7. And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times nor the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. He said, it's not for you to know that. Give me the next verse. Here's that promise. But ye shall receive power. When do I receive my power? After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me. Now look at where he says, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. See, he was talking to them, but he knew that his message was going to carry through to us. We are supposed to be his witnesses everywhere we go. We tell people what we have seen, what we have heard and what we have experienced. That is the testimony. If you just out there saying, yeah, I was going through this problem and he did that. No, that's not the same thing. I need to tell you what I saw, what I heard, and what I experienced. Okay, give me this next verse. The Bible says, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up. And a cloud received him out of their sight. So he just floated up in the air. Let me do it. He's just floating up into the air, just rising up. And then a cloud catches him. And then they can't see him anymore, right? Give me verse 10. Scripture says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up. They're looking up like this. It says, 
Behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Imagine you looking up like this and then all of a sudden you turn around and there's two other guys standing there looking at you. The Bible says two what? Men. Two men. Are they men? Yeah. They're angels. What is an angel? A messenger. Okay. Now watch this. Give me the next verse. Verse 11. It says, which also said ye men of Galilee. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Yahweh Shai, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so in like manner as ye have seen him. I'm sorry. Uh, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. How's he coming back? The same way. Well, how did he go? In a cloud. And what did he say? I'm coming with the clouds. Okay, so now watch this. We just saw the ascension of Christ. Now let's get into this day of Pentecost. Let's see these 3,000 souls and find out who they are. Give me Acts chapter 2 verse 1. The scripture says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2. And suddenly there came a sound. What came? You ever read that and think that wind came? What came? A sound came. What does it sound like? As of a rushing mighty wind. So what actually came? Was it wind or was it sound? It was sound. And he compared the sound to the rushing of wind. It says, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. Give me verse 3. And there appeared unto them, the them is the apostles, cloven, that word means split, tongues. You guys know what a tongue is, right? Like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Okay, so this thing comes into the room, this sound, this crazy sound, and then all of a sudden, these tongues are sitting on the men. Give me the next verse. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Who was filled? The apostles. Okay, now the apostles are about to speak to some people, but who's filled with the Holy Ghost? The people or the apostles? The apostles. The apostles. What did the Holy Ghost enable the apostles to do? Speak the testimony of Christ in a language that they could understand. Now, were the people filled with the Holy Ghost? No, they were not filled with the Holy Ghost. The apostles were, and they're speaking through the utterance of the Holy Ghost. Now watch, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak. What's that word right there? I need to, with. What did they do? They spoke with. Did they speak in? Nope. They spoke with other tongues. What is a tongue? Anybody in here speak it de Spanish? Speak it de Spanish. See, she says. Okay, poquito más. Okay, that's a different tongue, right? Anybody in here speak gibberish? Uh-oh. Nope. Don't nobody in here speak gibberish. Could you edify me if you were saying something to me that I did not understand? No. But if, I, if I'm up here giving the message and a guy comes running in and he only speaks Spanish, I'm going to be like, anybody in here speak Spanish? Because what do I need you to do so that he can receive the Holy Spirit? I need you to translate to him so that he can be edified because otherwise I just look like a banana up here waving my hands. He doesn't know what I'm talking about. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> All right, now watch this. It says, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. How did they do it? The Spirit gave them the utterance. Give me verse 5. Now here comes our part. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. What are they? Devout men. How do we know they're devout? Because they made a pilgrimage because of what it says in Deuteronomy. We're going to take a look at it. But you got to see the scripture tells you they're devout men because they came from wherever they were. All the way to Jerusalem for one purpose. What is it? Jesus. To keep the Feast of Weeks. Okay. So now we see that there are Jews. They're devout men out of every nation under heaven. These people came from everywhere. Give me Deuteronomy 16, 16. I know we covered it, but you need to tie these precepts together so that you can explain who these people are and what they're doing. Three times in a year shall all thy males appear before Yahweh, thy Allahayim, in the place which he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before Yahweh empty. Okay, take me back to Acts real quick, because now I know through the precepts why there's all these men from all different nations, and they're all in Jerusalem, because they are devout. They are keeping this commandment. Okay, but if they came from China, what language are they going to speak? 
probably going to speak Chinese. They could be an Israelite and be born in China and be speaking Chinese. If they came from Germany, they're going to be speaking German. Ain't that right? But I'm standing up there looking like a banana and I'm talking to them in English and they're like, mm, I don't know what this dude is talking about. Okay, so something is going to need to take place. You guys can see where this story is going. In order for them to receive the message that is, that's going to save their soul, they need to understand it in their own language. Take me back to Acts chapter 2 and let's get verse 6. The scripture says, Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together. That's the, all those people. Boom. And were confounded. Because that every man heard them speak. What does it say? Okay, I, that's pretty clear, right? He makes this thing clearer and clearer. This needs to be covered because people will tell you that the evidence of the Holy Spirit is you speaking in tongues. The scripture does not say that. The scripture says they spake with tongues and every man heard them speak in his own language. Give me verse 7. The scripture says, and they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? It's like, give me the next verse. It says, and how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? That's pretty clear, right? Let me tell you why some people believe in speaking in tongues. Because they're reading a counterfeit version of the Bible. That counterfeit version of the Bible gives you the ability to counterfeit the Holy Spirit by speaking in a language that does not exist and does not mean anything, but it looks real holy when you do it. See, Satan is all about counterfeiting the things of the Most High. How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Okay, if that's not enough, we are about to take a look at 18 different languages. He's going to list off 18 languages that they spoke. Give me the next verse. The scripture says, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia. What do they speak in Asia? A little Chinese, a little Japanese. Okay, give me this next one. It says, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Lib Libya about Rome. Stranger and strangers of Rome, Jews, I'm sorry, Phry Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene. And strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes. Give me the next verse. He says, Crete, where's Crete located at? That's in Greece, okay. And Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of the Most High, the wonderful works of God. Were they speaking a made up language, something that don't, nobody but the father could understand? OK, so if you have believed for any amount of time that that's what they did, you were deceived because the scripture is very clear about the power of the Most High. Okay, let's jump down. I want you to see what happened because these men who were there celebrating the Feast of Weeks were able to understand. Give me verse 36 real quick. We're going to jump down. You can read the rest at home when you get a chance. Watch. It says, now this is Peter. When they started speaking in these languages and everybody understood the ones who were resistant to it, who did not understand, they said, oh, these men are drunk. <laughs> these men are full of new wine. Because they didn't understand what was being said. And Peter begins to defend the Holy Spirit. And take a look at who he's talking to. He says, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay, so the Father made Christ, made Jesus our Lord and our Messiah, our Savior. Now watch, give me the next verse. After he prophesied this to the men who were at Jerusalem, who saw Jesus and killed him, Scripture says, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? What, what happened? He gave the testimony of Christ. They understood it. They found out that they killed the Messiah. And now they feel real bad. They're pricked in their heart. They're like, oh, we didn't know. We didn't understand. We were deceived. What are we going to do now? What do you think he tells them to do? The same thing every man of the Most High would tell anybody to do when you commit a sin. What do you do? Yeah. Repent. Okay, give me the next verse. Verse 38 says, then Peter said unto them, repent, 
and be baptized every one of you in the name of Shai HaMashiach for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. What is this gift of the Holy Ghost? We, the Holy Ghost itself is a gift. But what is the gift that the Holy Ghost is going to bring? See, this is like a gift within a gift because once you get this Holy Ghost, it comes with another gift. It's called power. That's good. There's one, there's one even more powerful than the power. Grace. That grace. See, because what did they do? They crucified Christ. But it was in their ignorance. They didn't know. So he says, repent, believe, be baptized. You're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, which is grace. So am I going to be held accountable for what I did? No, that grace is going to cover it. The Holy Ghost is going to bring that gift. Give me verse 39. Okay, now watch. It says, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. This gift, this promise is available to everybody and anybody. But who is he talking to? He's talking to Israel. Okay, well, how was the other nations going to even hear about this gift? They never even heard of a Holy Ghost. Well, once you get it and you get that grace and you get that power, you take that out to the nations. You go ye therefore and preach, teach every single person that you possibly can. Give me verse 40. Now watch, it says, and with many other words did he testify and exhort. What is testify? What was he doing? He was given the testimony of Christ and exhort. What, what was he doing? He was warning them. When I exhort you, I'm encouraging you, but I'm warning you at the same time. I'm encouraging you to do the right thing and warning you that if you don't do the right thing, something real bad about to happen. That's what exhort means. Okay. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. What does untoward mean? If I was moving toward you, it means backwards. This generation is backwards. You guys got to see he's speaking to them, but he's speaking through them to us because we live in a backwards generation right now. A man can just freely walk into the women's restroom right now, anytime he wants. And all he has to do is say, I identify as a woman, but you got a beard though. I identify as a woman. That's super backwards, right? We live in a backwards generation. What do we need to do? We need to save ourselves from this untoward generation. Now watch verse 41. That gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That is, that's amazing, isn't it? 3,000 men who were scattered all around the world out of all different nations were already keeping the commandments, made their way to Jerusalem for the Feast of Weeks, heard the testimony of Christ in the language that they could understand, repented for their sins, were baptized, and they were added to the church. That is, that is powerful, right? Hallelujah. So we can see that Pentecost represents a time of judgment for you. You already know Christ, but it's time for you to start moving in better judgment. You got to make better judgments. Your life needs to reflect a life that is being sacrificed to Christ. That's our reasonable service, right? Yeah. That we present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So you need to pray for judgment so that you can make it through these next three feasts. Now watch this. Pentecost also teaches us to count by sevens. When I count by sevens and I add one to it, what is it called? Eight. I like that. We got some math. It's called a jubilee. A jubilee. What does the jubilee tell us? The jubilee tells us exactly when Christ is returning. How much time was allotted to man? What? 120 years. And we're in Genesis chapter six. It tells you the days of man shall be 120 years. That's years of jubilees. Jubilees is 50. If I multiply 120 by 50, what do I get? 6,000 man was given six days to do all his work. And on the seventh day, what does he do? Rest. He rests. Okay. How long is a day with the Lord? Thousand, thousand years. So these 6,000 years, we know we are right at the end of this 6,000 years. But we learned that all the way back in Leviticus by counting by sevens. Give me Leviticus chapter 23 verse 15. I want you to see this part because it tells you what's going to happen at the end of the Jubilee. 
It says, and ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day he brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Give me verse 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, ye shall number 50 days and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. Okay. We get taught that in the middle of this feast, we need to start counting by sevens. Give me Leviticus chapter 25, verse 8. It says, and thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee. Okay, so now it's not weeks. What is it now? Years. It's years. Seven Sabbaths of years unto thee. Seven times seven years. And the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Give me verse 9. It says, then shalt thou cause the trumpet. What's that? Do, do, do. That's that shofar. Okay. What is it used for? A warning. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the 10th day of the seventh month. It's already up there. What day is that? The day of atonement. So on the day of atonement, I take my shofar and I blow it. Do, do, do. And it's a warning. What am I warning people? Christ is coming back. Okay, it says, In the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. So everybody can be warned. Give me verse 10. He says, And ye shall hallow the 50th year. Wait a minute. What is something when it's hallowed? It's holy. It's set apart. It's special. Ain't that right? Okay, so on the day of atonement, at the 50th year, I blow the trumpet. It says, and ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim. What's that word? Liberty. Liberty. What does that mean? Freedom. I'm free. So when do I become free? After the trumpet blows, after the 50th year. That's when I become free. I know it looks like I'm free. Look, it says, and ye shall proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a, look at that word jubilee unto you and ye shall return look you guys got to see this you shall return every man unto his possession and ye shall return every man unto his family what family are you from you from judah okay okay i'm from judah too what family are you from you from issachar okay where are you gonna go when the trumpet blows on the day of atonement after the 50th year you're gonna go back to your land every man unto his possession and ye shall return every man unto his family Okay, give me the next, this next verse. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to prove it. It says, A jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. Ye shall not sow, neither reap that which groweth of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thine vine undressed. Give me the next verse. It says, For it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. Ye shall eat. Remember we saw our little Hebrew thing and it said, you know what I'm saying? You're going to eat with the family and secure your experience. It says, ye shall eat the increase through thereof out of the field. Verse 13. Look at this command. It says, in the year of this jubilee, ye shall return every man unto his possession. I know all of this sounds very confusing, especially if you never heard of a jubilee. You never counted by sevens. You're like, I don't know what is being said to me. That is Old Testament. And then you flip to Psalms and you're like, ooh, I feel better now that I'm reading these Psalms. I don't have to count. I don't have to do nothing. Let me tell you what he says. Every man is going to return to his possession. What day is it going to be? The 50th day, right? It's on the 10th day of the seventh month, which is called the Day of Atonement, or the scripture refers to it as the Day of the Lord. The trumpet blows. And every man has freedom and returns to his possession. Okay. What is our possession? What, what, do we, what, what do we possess? <laughs> we possess some land. Let me show you what the Most High said we're going to return to when this trumpet blows on the Day of Atonement. Give me Genesis chapter 17, verse 7. Okay. This is the most high. It says, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their generations for a everlasting covenant. What is the covenant? To be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Give me verse eight. 
He says, and I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan. What are you giving it to us for? What does it say? For an everlasting possession. When that trumpet blows, what do we do? We return to our possession. Hallelujah. It says, and I will be their God. So the day of Pentecost is a, it's a pre-warning because the next thing that happens is a real warning. Okay. So nothing is going to happen. We don't have any more feast days coming up until we get to the 10th day of the seventh month. We got to talk about this real quick. Uh, some of y'all think the seventh month is July, huh? <laughs> July, not the seventh month. September is the seventh month, according to the most high. We'll have to get into that later. We don't have enough time right now. Okay. The seventh month is September. And on the 10th day is not September 10th. <laughs> we got to get into that another time. See, because part of the reason why we keep showing up late to all of our meetings with the most high is we don't know what time it is. Okay. On the seventh, on the 10th day of the seventh month, the trumpet is going to blow. That is our final warning. That is called the memorial blowing of trumpets. Okay. And then what's going to happen right after that is tabernacles. So we saw that graphic showing you the coming, the return of the Christ. We need to get ready from this time forward. We need to start living like he could be coming at any time. Let me show you this last verse real quick as we get ready to get into our feasting and our fellowship. Give me uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. The scripture says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days. You guys seen that verse before? Christians will use that verse to try to tell you that you don't have to keep these things. That is not what is being said. This is Paul speaking and he's talking to the Israelites saying, don't let no man judge you in respect of the things that the most high has commanded you to do. What did he command us to do? It says in meat, he commanded me to eat clean. Isn't that right? And to drink or in respect of a holy day, he commanded me to keep the feast of weeks. He commanded me to keep the new moon and he commanded me to keep the Sabbath days. Does that make sense? Am I supposed to let somebody judge me about that thing? You're giving me a hard time talking about I'm Old Testament? No. The scripture says, I'm not going to let you judge me. Watch. Verse 20. Give me verse 7. 17. It says, which are a shadow of things to come. These, these things are going to continue. What is it? The eating, clean, the drinking, the holy days, the new moons. All of those things are a shadow of things to come. But the body... What's the body? You are the body. But the body is of Christ. You are the body of Christ. Now, the Holy Spirit needs to be dwelling in your body. Amen. This is the message that I have for you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 